Uh, hey everyone, uh, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here we interview scholars, policymakers, journalists, entrepreneurs, and more about some of the most urgent issues and frontier ideas in the modern world. Uh, I'm Princeton sophomore Alapi Kalapudi, co-president of Envision and interviewer at Policy Punchline, and we're excited to be here with Dr. Lee Cronin. Dr. Cronin is the Regis Chair of Chemistry at the University of Glasgow, and has been elected to the Fellowship of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, the Royal Society of Chemistry, and has published over 350 papers and given hundreds of lectures. At Glasgow, he heads the Cronin Group, a lab that is motivated by the fascination for complex chemical systems and the desire to construct complex functional molecular architectures that are not based on biologically derived building blocks. Uh, we're going to start off by some of uh, Dr. Cronin's older research into artificial non-carbon based life forms. So I know that you're especially interested in sort of metallochemistry uh, and building life forms that interact uh, interestingly with chemistry. A lot of the other research into artificial life forms seems most interested in the search for extraterrestrial life, uh, but a lot of your interest seems interested in abiogenesis. What about understanding non-carbon based life forms will help us understand how we ourselves came to form? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons why I'm interested in non-carbon based life forms, that, I mean, what I mean by non-carbon actually, I should go further and really clarify that I don't mind having carbon. I just want to look for life that's based upon different uh, chemical and motifs, so not proteins, DNA, and so on. It may be that carbon is the only way to do it that we know that, that the universe can do right now, but I just don't want to make that assumption. I want to be broad. So all I'm saying is like, let's not use any of the building blocks we have in biology right now and try and search for new ones. So, um, and to try and ask what is it about the chemical search process or the abiogenesis that occurs over time what drives that process? So really going for non-carbon based life forms was really a way of saying, we, I just didn't want to have any bias from using biochemistry as a starting point. Because then the problem is if you use current biochemistry as a starting point, you may be missing the physical mechanism that gives rise to that biochemistry because that biochemistry is quite sophisticated. Yeah, and I know that, uh, so you've succeeded in creating uh, self-replicating bits of chemistry uh, sort of in a lab. So what does the boundary sort of exist between this sort of work and nanotechnology? Or does it all sort of meld together? Yeah, um, I mean, I would, I would say that nanotechnology, so there are two types of nanotechnology, I would like to say. There is the kind of top-down lithographic nanotechnology, which is basically driven by electrical engineering, okay? And, um, and then there is a nanotechnology that chemists and material scientists talk about. But I would say that that nanotechnology is really just making molecules and materials, but because we know more about them, we can, and we can look at them at the smallest scale, it gives us the illusion of nano control where we don't always have it, we always have to do it top down. The only way you're going to get bottom up nanotechnology um, efficiently is using evolution, because that's what the cell is. The cell is a finely orchestrated set of operations that use DNA, uh, uh, proteins, and lots of um, small molecules at the nano scale and the sub nano scale to affect transformations. So I think actually the emergence of evolutionary structures or stru sorry, structures that can take part in evolution, um, those molecular machines that result are produced by evolution. And I'm fascinated by the, is functional nanotechnology from the bottom up only achievable through evolution by trial and error? because basically you just don't have, it's not possible to construct those molecules correctly first time. The way, only way to do it, you can imagine doing it deterministically is from the top down using lithography. So is the idea then that if you were able to sort of introduce non-traditional molecules into a life form, you could sort of hijack the evolutionary process to produce uh, molecules of our, own, of our own use? Absolutely. I mean, and synthetic biologists do that right now, and they do that using biology um, and hijacking it exactly as you said, but probably even more than that. They can not only hijack it, but they can re-engineer it because they, know they can take a certain set of machinery, they know how it works, put it together. And in the next few decades, I mean, directed evolution, molecular biology, synthetic biology are really going to explode in that area. What I'm interested in doing is going a little bit lower than that, say, what is the physical process in the universe that allows the evolution to occur? And in fact, what is evolution? And this is quite a hard problem because obviously there's lots of philosophical, religious and scientific debates that all get mixed up. 
And I'm only really concerned with the naturalistic process that I'm a physical materialist, strict one. Um, and I believe in stuff and I want to, well, I don't believe in stuff. I accept stuff and I want to understand how stuff works. And I think that's really important and use evolution to, to do that. So I wanted to take a slight detour uh, into some of your work in automating chemistry, because I know that you've talked about sort of using round bottom flasks uh, and these complicated systems of wiring where you could give you know, a bunch of reagents uh, to the system and it can produce basically any molecule you care if you can give it precise enough instructions. Uh, obviously, if that was made to scale and you could sort of automate large parts of wet labs, it would massively speed up chemistry researchers. But beyond just a speed up, are there sort of qualitatively new things that just wouldn't, weren't possible before, even at a slower speed? Yeah, I think so. So one of the reasons why I built the hardware for the computer was I wanted to build a system that could robotically search the origin of life. That's number one. And number two, I realized, I mean, I'm really a, I, I don't know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I don't know, constructivist, if you want. I'm, I love von Neumann, but he wasn't constructing in reality. He was constructing in his brain, which was the biggest brain ever, I think, right? Von Neumann was just the biggest genius. So what I'm inspired- a couple of halls here at Princeton named after him because of yeah, all of his accomplishments. I guess so, right. Well, you know, the concept of the universal constructor was built by von Neumann with Feynman and a few others, okay? But the problem with their constructor is it was an abstract entity, didn't exist. So my chemical computer wasn't just built to just make molecules. It is the first universal chemical constructor. That means I can put in any, any language, any control, and it will make the molecule. But the nice thing is it does it at a distance because the abstraction collapses down to the physical molecule, where if you're thinking about cellular automata, you're actually writing the code for those automata to construct themselves within that universe. And that's why I think Stephen Wolfram and everyone else are really interested in that universe, but I'm interested in physical space. What do I do to physical space to actually make a constructor? So now I have this concept of the chemical constructor. And what becomes possible? Well, in a mundane way, I can make more complex molecules because I will not run out of time. So right now, chemists can't make really complex molecules because they just don't have enough time in their lives, their PhDs, their postdocs, their industry, because, you know, if you could have a, 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 a robot, like a server farm of robots, just doing that in the background, it's a bit like saying, is Bitcoin possible today without computers? Well, yeah, you could have a bunch of human calculators in a warehouse, but they wouldn't get very far in Bitcoin space, right? Mining the, yeah. you know, the, the, those, those coins. So what, what, the com what computation does, it massively speeds that up. Whether that is the right use of energy on the planet right now, who knows? I don't think so. But with a computer, the really interesting thing is just not making abstract entities. Those entities are molecules and have value. They cure disease, can be used to affect your physical world. They're not just abstract entities. So that's one change that it was a massive change. The other change is this unification in exploring chemical space. But right now, the um, chem informatician could tell you there are more molecules possible within the low molecular weight range than there are atoms in the universe. So 10 to the 80 atoms in the universe, 10 to the 80 molecules. But that doesn't seem right to me. That, doesn't, that seems to be ignoring the fact that we don't have enough resource to make those molecules. So what I think the chemist is trying to say, oh, I can imagine a graph that would correspond to these molecules. How can I realize that graph? What the computer allows you to do is search chemical space and work out what graphs are makeable. And that's, I think, a really important thing. So there's two things, discovery and just getting there. So, you know, it's like, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna change everything and it is changing everything. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things that has helped make computers so revolutionary is that the transistor, which is sort of our fundamental building block uh, for chips, have been brought down and down and down in size again and again. Uh, with chemistry, it seems like there'd be more of a natural limitation because flasks can only get so small before they're uh, sort of unusable. Do you think there's a way around that and you can bring it maybe if not to the size of transistors to a significantly smaller scale? Or um, do you think... Yeah, I, 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 let me just... I'm sorry, I'm cutting off your question, yeah. but I know what you mean. So the question is, can you, can you scale down the chemistry? You don't need to. I think the Moore's law in, in, chem in computer space was actually the power of the computer is directly proportional to the number of switches you can get on the dial. Well, not directly proportional, is a function of. 
In chemistry, the limitation is not the number of flasks. The limitation is the, um, the way those flasks are, explore, are, are organized with respect to each other. So right now, the Moore's law is going to be, or the whatever law, the chemical law, is going to be the number of molecules you can make per year. So what drove the value in, in um, computing was to double the, 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 the doubling time for putting transistors on a chip. The equivalent in chemistry is, what is the doubling time for new molecules made? There's a space of 10 to the 80 molecules. Come on, make them, make them, make them. Then you can work out how big the chemical reactor needed to be, you know, to how much time is left in the universe that you couldn't even make those. So if we could just double, it decrease the doubling time. It's taken, what, 100 years to maybe make two, discover 200 million molecules. If we could get that down to two years, because we're automating everything, it's not about the size of the flask, it's about the reliability of the automation. So I think that we're not about scale of molecule. And so this is not a scale about um, dimensions now. This is a scale about number of molecules. And do you see the difference? And it's kind of cool. Yeah. And I guess especially because once you have more complicated flask setups, it's not just about cramming a bunch. It's about different chemical setups. And if you can find all those within your, within your computer, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I guess another question is, if you are successful in building this automated chemistry, presumably uh, these tools will get outside of the lab at some point. Uh, and I know you've alluded to this in a couple of your talks where like, you know, sort of like the automated meth lab or the automated gunpowder production facility. Uh, do you anticipate there being long-term risks if you're able to like democratize chemistry to such a large extent? So, I mean, democratization is a strange word. Um, it, I, I want, I want, Digit, I want chemistry to be digitized in the R&D lab just so we get access to new molecules. Now, whether we should empower people to make their own molecules in their, own, in their, in their, in their kitchens and whatnot, we're a long way away from that. Um, but what I would say is, is I am worried about the prospects, but it doesn't keep me awake at night. Why? Because um, what I think is the benefits that are going to be gained by making new drugs and discovering new molecules that are going to be used for good massively outweighs the, the bad actors. Because right now, if you imagine the people that are the bad actors in, in any kind of environment, whether you're, you know, uh, let's say, let's just say you're a drug dealer or you're making illicit materials. Um, obviously, you are making those materials, you, you're, in, you're incentivized to do it anyway, you're breaking the law. The law is still not going to be changed, right? You know, if you make these molecules in a computer, you are still breaking the law. And, and so what I think we should say is like in the future, should we give the robot some um, chemical awareness? And I'll give you one really good example that I like, the look, that I like a lot. And I, and I didn't ever think I'd get into ethics and computer science, but here I am. And it's a good question. So if you take, go back a few years ago, there was a sad event where a plane crashed into the Swiss Alps, I think it was. And that was a German wings flight. And what happened was the pilot, the co-pilot, locked out the main pilot out of the cockpit, used the kind of anti-terrorism door, locked it, and then sent the altimeter to 100 meters and the, over the, over the and press go, and the plane just flew into the mountains and everyone died. The guy committed suicide. Now, this is the argument I would say here, that why did the software allow that to happen? Well. The people that programmed it didn't think that anyone would ever use the plane to crash into the mountains. So now what you could probably say is, well, what could we do to make sure the plane would say, well, look, I need, I want the pilot to control me, but hey, if I'm becoming within a hundred meters of the mountains, I don't want to be there. So I think I'm trying to think inspired by that tragedy, what could I do or how can I tell people to say, hey, you know what, we're designing all this hardware. Should we think about things that clearly no one is ever going to want the user computer to do. So that's one thing. But the other thing I should remind you and say, look, the computer will be used to make cancer, anti-cancer drugs. Some of those anti-cancer drugs are actually chemical warfare agents, nitrogen mustards. So if we kind of make it too ethical, we might get it from stopping curing someone's cancer. So what we've got to do is understand the context. There is no context in which that airplane should ever be within 100 meters out. Never, ever, ever. So we can fight, and that's, that would have saved 328 people's lives or whatever it was, right? It was a, so if we can do the same thing here, I think that's really worth thinking about. 
Um, and so I'm worried about it. I'm worried about it enough to talk about it openly and say, hey, this is a problem that will come. It's going to be great to have the problem because that means we're going to be designing all these new drugs. But let's not use the wonderful thing it can do to say we don't need to think about the context because we can and we can code and we can and and look we can give people jobs in the future to make them molecular ethicists molecular computer ethicists to say okay what safeguards can we put in place to stop people doing undesirable things but helping them do desirable things and also who decides what's desirable or undesirable maybe in the future we want to hack our own you know, dopamine receptors in a new way. And if we're not harming anyone and we don't die, then maybe it's okay. But that's really not a discussion I want to get into. I'm not qualified and I don't want to be enabling that. Yeah. And sort of on a related question, you were talking about the timeline. Uh, so what are the current challenges to, to scaling this out? Is it just an issue of better understanding the chemistry or are there like technical hardware limitations uh, that are getting the way? it works. I mean, we've, we, we worked, we've just made, we've just established a company. I have 24 computers in the lab, it works. It's beautiful. I mean, it's probably the most exciting, apart from the global pandemic, which is not that exciting, it's very terrible. Um, um, in the last year, we have shown that we can take the literature and convert the literature into any molecule um, on demand. There are some hardware limitations and we showed the hardware is getting more and more robust and can do more and more things. And our programming language is universal. So I'm super excited because there is no barrier now. The only barrier, well, there are three big barriers. Obviously there is, I need to build a company because I've got a research lab and I want to build a company to do it. So my research lab can't just build robots for other labs. You know, we're doing science. We're funded by taxpayers, by some philanthropic organizations and so on. So there's getting the, 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 uh, the company to do that. The other thing is, I think that we really want to change culture. Chemists are still manual artisan, creative, you know, it's like saying to a Michelin star chef, we're going to chip replace you with a robot. And they would say, no, no, you're not actually, I'm really good at this. So what we've got to try and do is show how the chemist, we're not replacing the chemist with a robot. We're enabling the chemist to make molecules they couldn't dream of before. And that's the angle that I want to take and go forward. That's, but there's a cultural barrier. So there's a scale up barrier in terms of making the stuff, enough of it so people can get it. There's a cultural barrier. And then the final barrier, which is a bit boring, but has to be overcome. And that's making the technology more and more reliable. Yeah. But yeah, it's here. I mean, it really isn't science fiction anymore. 10 years ago, when I started to say this, everyone was like, no, nah, it won't work, it's impossible. But it really works now. And kind of, it's the most exciting thing ever when I go in the lab and I actually see the robot that I designed in my head a decade ago and everyone said it was impossible. When I realized that chemistry, just like Turing machine and von Neumann's constructor could be made universal, everything clicked. And so, yeah, and that's kind of a nice story, actually. Yeah, I mean, not quite to put you on the spot, but would you be comfortable saying that in 15, 20 years, you expect your computers to sort of take the place that 3D printers have taken and sort of automated prototyping? Um, be... I, I, being put on the spot with timescales is ridiculous because I'm always going to get it wrong. Is it going to happen? Yes. Will there be digital universal chemistry serving humanity? Yes. When will it happen? I need to find enough, you know, investors who want to create the future. It's about money, education, and luck when it comes yeah. to time. But yeah, it's going to happen. I mean, you know, I'm starting, um, I now have 12 computers in my lab. I'll have 24 by the end of the year. I'm putting computers into other companies. There's one at GSK, which is a pharmaceutical company in the UK. There's one in Berlin in the materials uh, automation facility there. So they're starting to leak out, you know, and... Um, I guess it might be like looking at mainframe developments, right? When the first mainframes came online, who had them? You know, were they in warehouses for a time and then suddenly there needed to be other technology developed and then suddenly they went exponential or they got lower in size and suddenly you have a cell phone in your hand. So, you know, I would like it to be, um, if I was gonna be pushed on the most optimistic timeline, which is probably impossible, I would like to say within five years, um, we have, would have enough funding and capability that we were basically putting computers into every lab in the world that wanted them. And that within 10 years that they would be replacing 90% of, 95% of all manual labor in the laboratory, first down chemistry laboratory. And then in 20 years, maybe they would start to make out when pe people would stop manufacturing drugs in big manufacturing facilities, but would micro scale them so suddenly the computers would be retasked because as the personal medicine would develop, 
why would you need a massive factory to make a drug for one person? You need to make it so, and so I think that's I think personal meds will drive that in the future. But there's regulations to overcome, you know, and other bits and bobs, and that's why timing is really. But well, you know, I'm what 47 now. 20 years time, I might still be alive. Hopefully, you know, 30 years time. You know, by the time I'm by the time I die, digital chemistry will be everywhere. It's no question. I sort of wanted to dig into the, the cultural uh, barriers you mentioned, because I know that law has recently gone through a similar thing where the power of automation has been able to remove a lot of the grunt and labor work. But sort of as an accidental side effect, it's they've accidentally destroyed their, tra their training pipeline because much of the training pipeline for lawyers involved doing lots of manual search work through documents and stuff and then picking up the craft that way. And my understanding of chemistry is that it's similar, that in your PhD and your undergraduate, you spend a lot of time doing what is essentially grunt work, but learning the craft as you go. How do you anticipate that training pipeline changing if digital chemistry is, is successful at what it hopes to be? So I, I think that's a useful question. I, d I don't know um, about, it'd be interesting to find out about how the, the, it works in terms of law and law training. There is a, what I would like to have in the future is people hacking together robots to do different transformations they couldn't make before. And I don't know, maybe, maybe the, the problem with, with looking at something, a, a, a abstraction like the legal system, the way to learn the abstraction, there's only certain ways you can learn it. So maybe you have to do some searching and build that. And maybe they just have to modernize that process rather than, you know, rather than having a chaotic kind of understanding of how you get stuff to standardize it a bit more. So may, what I would say that chemistry is going to need for a while is people need to understand solvents, chemicals, ratios and all that stuff but some of it will be made really simple and then they will be building on that layer the abstraction layer um, so i think it is i think the comparison with something that's entirely abstract is um is probably not quite the best one because you still have to have it i guess i'd like to learn from car mechanics because when i take my car i have an audi to the garage to be to be serviced they don't take out bits now they plug in a diagnostic system that says, oh yeah, these are our tolerance, replace this module. And so I think what it does, and I, I wonder if it dehumanizes a bit. If I was gonna be a mechanic today, I'd love to have an old car and getting the distances right, my spark plugs and looking at the distributor and you know, just understanding how it all works. Um, and I think what's gonna happen is a lot of what chemists do now is gonna be standardized and modularized and maybe some of that will not be needed. And then there are, is there a romance in that? We're losing the romance. You're losing the romance of searching in the library and finding stuff. But is it romantic? It was just boring, probably, and not and a waste of time. And so I think that you know, I think the old point is like to pinpoint what skills are being lost by saving time, and how can we create new skills opportunities? If I was a lawyer now, I'd be using GPT three to write new types of legal phrases and see if I could crack the legal system by hacking it, by nesting logic, you know, I would like to find the halting problem in the legal system, <laughs> you, you know, using some kind of uh, legal syntax. I think I might be talking out of, out of, you know, out of my pay grade here. I simply don't know how that might yeah. work, but I, I'm sure that lawyers will find ways to make the system even more rich, um, yeah. you know. Uh, and then sort of, sort of on the topic of, you know, sort of like the structure of academia. I know that uh, you obviously run a very large lab and you mentioned that this, the work you're sort of doing, you want to do on the corporate side. And I know you've also complained in the past about key performance indicators in, in the ways that academic research is assessed. Uh, yeah. Do you think that that's a system that will sort of fix itself over the long term, Or do you think that we're going to end up in this place where that there's something that are just very hard to do inside of academia? Um, I don't know, right? Everyone, I was list, I'm, li I'm listening to lots of modern podcasts where young people are talking about the world and they're talking about the world being in crisis, right? And there is, there's a political crisis in the world and there's a crisis of demand and crisis. There's a crisis whereby we, I think we have enough resource in the world and, um, and we've got to try and redistribute people's, um, um, I don't know, time and how do we educate people? Is a university fit for purpose? I mean, uh, I can tell you from my personal experience, right? I mean, the whole thing about KPIs is quite funny because of course, 
although I don't tell people what, you know, I don't say how many papers have I published this year as a KPI, I obviously want to publish my work. And the reason why I want to publish my work is not just my work, it's work with my team, it's ideas we had together, we want to influence the world. Public, me publishing a paper is not a medal, it's for me to hack your brain so you read this and go, oh, I want to do this, or I want to think about this. So it, I think that really we are kind of like all this kind of complaining, we're self-defeating. What am I paid to do? I am paid to teach, train, think, explore, discover, right? Whatever combination of things, and then invent new technologies and all that stuff. So what I'd like to do is remind people about what is the problem, what inspires you? And, and sure, the university system, is it going to collapse in the next 100 years? I don't think so. Is it going to change radically because of the printing, the modern printing press? Sure. I mean, you could get a degree by going on YouTube now and just following the tutorials, right? So we need, but what is clearly not happening right now, people thinking, aren't thinking critically enough. We're, we're having our brains hacked by social media. Um, Twitter is a horrible place. For, Twitter turns really smart people into idiots because they just are, you just, you just are doing sociological experiments all the time. So I do think that there are barriers in the way of me doing science or, the, or maybe I put barriers in the way of me doing science, worrying about KPIs, worrying about admin, worrying about funding. But actually what keeps me going is I wake up every day and every day I've got a new idea I want to try and I've got lots of smart people around me and they're also motivated. So I think what we've got to do is not lose sight on the creativity and the fact that my job is to basically annoy the system to think in new ways hopefully not break the law, you know, and do bad things, but to push the boundaries of where our culture and our intellect are going and ask, why don't we do that? And that's what I think that a modern university should be about, right? And couldn't everyone be in the modern university? Um, I said to someone the other day, I was a Star Trekian, and they're like, oh my God, that's so terrible because look at Star Trek, it was so um, politically correct, they were all sexist. And I was like, oh, okay, I wasn't paying attention to that bit. What I mean is, I can see a future where everyone has a universal financial, has a universal income. There's more free time. There's more incentive on creativity. And we need to find that balance between creativity and reward and how that works. But I can tell you what motivates me. I am super inspired by discovery. What finding if, well, finding if I can create life on earth would help me find, work out how obvious it is that the universe is alive and where to find other life in the universe. That's kind of my number one mission. That's what gets me through the admin nonsense that happens now and then. That's a long answer to a simple question. <laughs> I mean, sort of, sort of getting back to the extraterrestrial life issue. To what extent is your work on artificial life, uh, in you know, guided and inspired by the search for extraterrestrial life? To what extent is it sort of separate? Uh, like, are you are you motivated by like the gases on Jupiter or on some exoplanet? Or are you mostly just I want to create something in my lab? if it helps the astronauts and the astronomers good for them? No, it's all together. I mean, I want to understand if the universe is alive, you know, and it is alive. We're examples of it. So are we the only life in the universe? Um, I think from me, I mean, I'm, of course, I could be completely wrong. But I look around and, I'm, you know, gravity is reliable. Electric fields are reliable. My chemistry, my computers get even more reliable. So things seem to work, right? So... Is there anything that stops chemistry from working on other planets elsewhere? I can't see it. Maybe I'm too stupid to see it or, you know, there's some big mystery that I'm not understanding. But I think life is everywhere in the universe. So I'd like to know how to find it. And so I think me making life on Earth is a great thing to try and do because it's important for chemistry. It does some important things for um, the search for extraterrestrial life. It allows us to say, well, what actually is life? Because we don't know what it is, really. Life is a bit weird in that regard. It breaks the laws of physics. Um, um, and then what I mean by that, in the, um, if you're a physicist in the universe right now and you play all the equations forward, you don't get life coming out. You don't. So there's something missing in physics, right? Physics is wrong. So you know, say, say that to physicists. They like start to go, but I can explain all this stuff. I'm like, yeah, but take a universe, simulate everything. Life doesn't happen. Why not? And, that's, and they can't answer that question. It really is a nice showstopper for physicists. So that's one point. So if I can make life in the lab, we can start to help the physicists think. 
differently about information because they're wrong about information because they're too influenced by von Neumann and Shannon and they're using the wrong tools to look at information and observation. Secondly, or thirdly, I can then help NASA and ESA and who else look in the right places in the universe. But the most important thing, we need to recognize it when we see it. Because right now, there's a very strong possibility we will not recognize new life when we see it. And that would be such a shame. <laughs> I wanted to sort of push into the physics stuff a little bit. I'm certainly not a physicist by training. But my understanding was that sort of the cosmological models that they run are at such a large scale that they're sort of interested about planets forming and life wouldn't form. And similarly, the quantum models are interested in sort of the scattering of individual molecules and again, aren't of the scale. So what part of the model is it just that they don't have good models for like humans, human size uh, interactions or is there something else with the model that you think is missing? So I would think if you were speaking to a hardcore physicist, um, they would probably say, look, it's a hard problem. We just haven't got there yet. There's no reason to believe that the current understanding of quantum mechanics and fields and, and the way planets form um, has got anything magical in it, right? Like, there's nothing magical in life. And that's true. I wouldn't disagree with that. However, the way, they, the, the, the way that we look at how the universe invents selection and then um, evolution is really quite deep and confusing. Because for a physicist, causation is different to what maybe a philosopher, well, maybe physicists and philosophers actually agree on some aspects of causation. But when we start to talk about free will or determinism or agency in biology, the question about that decision-making in biology and the decision making in their plan, does a pendulum make a decision to swing? Did I make a decision to talk to you today? What do we mean by those words? They all are joined in material and energy and description, but yet they, there is a disconnect. So it's not just about the model. It's not just about the size. It's about a conceptual problem that is because we don't know what life is. We don't understand information in biology. We understand our way we've developed as observers to look at the world, but because we are it, we, in observing ourselves is actually quite hard, we have a blind spot. And this is kind of my, you know, it's a bit of an after this, one day we'll go back to the bar again and drink and maybe have discussions of spaces. It's kind of my, you know, bar time physicist chat to say, you can't see yourself in the mirror because you're, you have the observer, the, you are the observer complex, the kind of God complex. So how do you emerge the observer in the universe? As a chemist, I'm really interested in that process. I want to create the observer or think of a model in which the observer gets created in the universe by the universe and then observe itself and say, right, what are we missing? What is life? What is missing physics? What is time? What is information? What is evolution? What is causation? What is decision making? And these things. You know, what is, what is consciousness in terms of the abstraction? Because there are four big problems, I would say. There is origin of life, okay? Uh, intelligence, okay? Uh, consciousness and compute, what is computation, okay? And all those problems are the same problem in a different order. You know, Stephen Wolfram would say that the universe is doing computation. Well, okay, but that's, that's not very satisfying for me because I haven't seen any evidence the universe has comp seen a computation. I can see that I can create an abstraction in the universe that treats the universe like a computation, but that's not the same thing. And, and so I'm, I'm really, I want to understand the ground truth, like the ground truth that allows chemistry with physics to turn into biology. And we don't have that yet. I sort of wanted to dig into the computational stuff a little bit, because I know that you've also done work uh, sort of, maybe not computers, but computers built using chemistry uh, of, of trying to, to build a new model. And you've spoken about how it might stand alongside classical computing, quantum computing, and sort of the new, the new kid on the block, neuromorphic computing. Uh, so both, uh, so quantum computing's big advantage comes because it's a fundamentally different model of computation, that the interference effects allow for massive advantages over classical computing for certain problems. 
Neuromorphic computing is mostly about chip design and, and mimicking the 3D structure of the brain. And that's where it gains its advantage over classical computing. What do you see as the advantage of chemical uh, over the, the classical quantum and neuromorphic paradigms? Okay, good question. So let me, the neuromorphic computing is a strange word. Neuromorphic computing is not 3D computing, not really. Because, uh, and I would push back on this a little bit. It could one day, but the problem with neuromorphic computing right now is use the conventional CMOS technologies. And those CMOS technologies are static. You can connect them up and have a, you know, use an FPGA or some kind of reconfigurable system to do it. But still, quite essentially, you have CMOS architectures lithographically designed on a chip. Take quantum computers again. They are lithographically designed. They, some of them, they use it. They are using the same hardware. Now, of course, quantum computing is in branch your space. So you're looking at it. I don't know that quantum computers exist yet. I know that analog computers exist using quantum effects. But I'm not sure that anyone's demonstrated. So that's really interesting. So that, both those are above my pay grade. I don't know enough about electrical engineering to say what neuromorphic computing is, and isn't, is or isn't, but they do use existing lith lithographic architectures. I don't know enough about quantum information theory, but again, they use the same architectures and interface it to a silicon computer. So I was thinking, well, look, worst case scenario, and a quantum computer is an analog computer using quantum effects. Could I make an analog computer with chemistry and, act, and read things out using chemical effects? It's a kind of borrowing from quantum computer, but now I'm using doing it in a completely different substrate. So what I'm interested in doing is basically saying, well, look, what is interesting about the brain? What is interesting about life? What is interesting about creativity? Well, creativity, and I know it might seem a bit weird, but the, I'll, the, the brain has a trillion neurons, 10 to the 12 neurons. Then that each neuron is connected to 1,000 other neurons, but not the same neurons, you can reconfigure it. So there are more configurations in your brain right now than there are atoms in the universe. When you go to a neuromorphic chip, there are not more configurations, so there are not more accessible configurations in a neuromorphic chip than there are in atoms in your universe. In a quantum computer, maybe, if you can get it to work, you can, I mean, combinatorially explode. It's fascinating. So I was just like, well, could I come up with a chemical system where I could get the connectivity of the brain, but not the restrictions of lithography? And that's what we're working on right now. And because I think the state space is bigger. And I guess if I want to be really controversial, I wonder if the only way to instantiate a consciousness or a something that has, an, has the ability to go AGI is not about an infinitely reprogrammed neural net. It's about how many states do you have available? And, so, and how do you train that object to use those states? So I'm kind of got this little fantasy that probably yeah, we can make a chemical brain um, if we can get that chemical brain on board of the connectivity of the normal brain and train it a bit, the really amazing things are going to happen. I'm curious what you mean by the limits of lithography, because, for example, with Google Sycamore chip, which is sort of the recent breakthrough in quantum computing, they're using like super cooled cobalt, uh, and it seems like pretty distinct from the structures. And similarly, a lot of the neuromorphic computing is using still silicon, uh, unlike Google, was using an entirely different structure. Yeah but they're using like very weirdly formed silicon. So I'm curious, like in what way is, is a chemical computer more reprogrammable than reconfigurable silicon or movable so, cobalt atoms? So, let, so let's just accept there are, three, there are three paradigms right now, right? And I'll give you, you, your, you know, you're pushing back and saying, hey, they are different. Let's just, let's assume you're right. I don't think you're entirely right, but I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna lean on um, some things for chemical computing that, quantum computing needs to lean on and neuromorphic computer, and let's be fair. So let's just say there's standard lithography, there's fancier designs for quantum computers, that's definitely true, right? Because quantum computers do not, they have to have, qubits have to be maintained in a certain way, whether it's spin, photonic or whatnot, as you're pointing out, and then let's take neuromorphic. The neuromorphic ones for me seem a little bit, they're still basically the same technology, but I don't know enough about how they behave differently. But neuromorphic ones, their connectivity is limited. You do not have more than, they are limited. In the quantum computer, the connectivity is not, is limited by the error propagation and all that, so fine. So all I'm saying, I suppose, that the, the, the best case scenario 
Uh, well, no, the, the, the way to compare them is you've got silicon, quantum, neuromorphic, and what I want to invent is chemical. Now, why do chemical computers not exist yet? Lots of people have been playing with chemical reactions to make logic gates, but they're enforcing, they're forcing the chemistry to do a macroscopic logic gate. What we need to do instead is exploit the reactions um, in the medium and, and connect them in a massive way to we so we can access that potential state space. So I think that that's what I'm trying to say here is I want to make chemical systems that I, because then I have to, right now, I have to embed them in, into a hybrid silicon architecture. My chemical computer is as, pro, as dependent on silicon as a quantum computer, because if you can't interface your quantum computer to another computer, you're not going to read anything out. Same with the chemical computer and same with neuromorphic computer. So that's why I kind of, you know, gave you your, your, your comment fully. So now the state is said, right, we have quantum, um, neuromorphic, and chemical. The chemical computer has lots of limitation compared to say a, a neuromorphic computer, right? It uses chemicals, it's gonna be reaction rates, there's gonna be you know, discrepancies with things. So what can the chemical computer give you that maybe these others can't? Well, it has to be that connectivity. So we have to have some kind of substrate. The other thing is that because you can do the computation physically, it's a physical th things are moving. If you were to do it in a gel, for instance, and you're reprogramming the gel, suddenly you are using the plasticity of the material in 4D or even 5D. We'll talk about that in a moment, but certainly Cartesian space and time, and then using that hysteresis to basically explore other problems. So I'm fascinated with that, and I would literally like you know to make a. Uh, a series of liquid and gel-based computers interface with the world and, and looking at, you know, problems that maybe are different to silicon ones, but would, you know, what could a chemical computer beat a quantum computer and a, a, and a conventional computer at, you know, and, and maybe a neuromorphic one. Um, and so, you know, at the very minimum, the chemical computer gives you a fourth new type of computational uh, technology. So just to sort of poke in a little bit. Uh, so is the is the idea that the advantage comes because if you're, you know, running a reaction in some solvent, the reactions are happening everywhere. So it's sort of fully distributed or there's some, uh, or is there some other advantage over that I'm missing? So there's many advantages. The first one is not just the distribution, it's scale. So what you could do is you can, if you take what 18 milliliters of water, you have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules in there, 10 to the 23 molecules. If you could exploit all of those, the states of those molecules, you'd have a computer with far more processing power that, than, you know, in that, that, in that water than, than anything else on the planet. But it, it's hard to imagine getting down to the molecular level, but you've got scale. The other thing that you can do is you can, you could, um, Allow reaction diffusion chemistry to build to to do to look at the to use chemical oscillations to process information. You could also combine memory and operations together. Now DNA computers exist, so I would say maybe they're another type of chemical computer, but they're not quite really because they're not they are they're single shots. So you basically you know code up the DNA and then and then maybe read out what you get. So what we're trying to do with a DNA gel chemical system is make sure that you can reprogram the thing in real time. And so the, 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 the um, outcomes are distributed, scaled, okay, error corrected, because you can correct the errors, but also you can do the computation and the memory in the same place. And that's really interesting because if you go to a normal silicon computer, you obviously have a memory separate to your CPU. So what I'm interested in doing is making sure the chemistry combines the memory and the process space together. I'm sorry, that's a very waffly answer. We are still trying to work out in the same way there's lots of quantum algorithms out there that are working, written and simulated. We're trying to work out exactly what chemical algorithms best map to our various chemical silicon computers that we have at the moment. Yeah. I guess like the, the final area that I kind of wanted to look into was some of your work in terms of like energy and battery tech uh, in terms of energy technology. So obviously this is like 
you know, one of the most important problems of our time, right? Many of our, of our hopes is to rely on improving battery tech. And sort of the, the standard model right now is largely lithium ion. And many of the, of the attempts to advance it, like Professor John B. Goodenough, you might be familiar with it at UT Austin, are based on sort of using biological techniques like sugar. Uh, but you seem to be one of the relatively few hypercar researchers who are trying to extend batteries in some radical way using non-organic techniques. So, and especially using nanotechnology specifically rather than sort of macro design. So what inspired you to look at batteries and energy tech in this way? So, yeah, so look, I'm a, I, I like asking the fundamental questions. There's a lot of investment going on battery technology right now. A lot of really good groups working around the world um, optimizing new materials. I started off life as a, metal ox a molecular metal oxide chemist. And molecular metal oxides are, and these are molecules of oxygen metal uh, um, um, uh, clusters. So what you could do is rather than having like an infinite material like a salt, these molecules have metals in them and there's oxygen linking them together. And the way we grow these, we would add electrons to them as you reduce them. And a few years ago, I was playing around the idea of could I get more, because the idea of a battery, what is this, what is the problem with a battery? Well, you want to get as many electrons per unit volume as possible, right? That's the, that's the name of the game. If you think about, say, hydrogen storage, why is hydrogen storage really interesting? Well, hydrogen is the smallest atom in the universe, okay? And it makes a small molecule. And with those two hydrogen atoms, you have two electrons. So hydrogen is really a compact way of storing electrons. It's kind of annoying because it explodes and you have to keep it, cool it down and compress it. But it's really, hydrogen for me is like the ultimate electron store because you can force a lot into a small space. And so I was thinking, right, okay, with my molecular metal oxides, could I put electrons into these oxygens, or sorry, into these oxides and get more electrons in than normal? And so we developed, uh, by accident, we, were, we found that we could store so we made a cluster which looks like a soccer ball shape, an American soccer ball or an English rugby ball. So it's kind of an ellipse with 18 metals in it. And we found, and it was about a nanometer across. And we were able to put 18 electrons in a one nanometer, you know, cubed volume. We we're like, wow. So this overnight, we were able to increase the energy volumetric electron capacity. I have to get the words right, because it's, you know, otherwise get the wrong terms. Um, by 18 times compared to, well, it's about 10 times actually, um, when you, because some had two, three electrons in there. And so we got into that and we realized we can make a flow battery. Um, and the idea would be that, you know, I know that Tesla has these big heavy batteries. You go to your, you go to your, uh, your, your gas station and you would just literally take out the old battery liquid and pipe in a new liquid, same time to refuel as now, maybe 15, 20, 30 seconds and you're all electric and off you go. So that was one dream we were playing with. There is one really big reality check, which is so annoying. This uses tungsten oxide. Tungsten oxide is super heavy, as in it weighs a lot, it's gloopy, and it's expensive, and there's not enough on the planet to put in everyone's car. So one of the dreams I've got, if I had another life and I could work in parallel worlds, you know, I don't know, maybe like be like Elon Musk, but in chemistry, I would love to basically start a company where I would look at taking rust, that is iron oxide, and finding a way to stabilize iron oxide in water so I can load up the iron oxide and make a battery out of that. And I think it's possible. I just don't know how yet. You know, it's like the problem with iron oxide, it crystallizes in your form of material, you need it to flow. So that's our little contribution. It's not, it's not as great as some other things, and you're right. Some people are using nanotechnology to make porous materials. It's a bit like a sponge. And if you could drill a hole in a material, make the, make the cavities that really align, you almost like 3D print a sponge, you could load that up with all the electrons and the ions, and you can make a really brilliant battery that wouldn't age as much. You could recycle and, you know, so I think we're going to get there. It's really exciting. It's a lot of hard work. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, so I guess we're sort of, uh, reaching the end of our time. So uh, before we end the interview, I just want to ask if there's a final takeaway either about your, your automated chemistry, about batteries, but anything else you specifically want to talk about that you'd like to leave our listeners with. Um, no, not really. So I think there's kind of three takeaways. The first thing is I'm trying to find how, what physical process made the universe decision-making. 
And, and I'd encourage you guys to think crit critically about, is an asteroid in the asteroid belt making a decision? Are you making a decision to listen to the podcast? What's the physical difference? If you're interested by that, that's cool. The second point is that um, I think that, you know, von Neumann and Feynman and Turing and all, and all the computer scientists today make building on, you know, the Turing machine or at least the practical instantiation have been making universal kind of abstractions in software. And I think the computer is really the first universal abstracted constructor that can make things. And I'm excited by that, but we need to go further. Could we imagine one, a, nan a nanotechnology that would do that? I mean, is that scary? Would it overtake the planet or, you know, going beyond making molecules? And I guess the, the, the final thing is to really think about, um, um, you know, what information is really, you know, when did, when does the, when did the universe invent information? Um, I, that's one of the, my biggest quests. It's very hard for me to pose it properly. Lots of physicists tell me why I'm thinking about it imprecisely, um, but maybe the language doesn't yet exist to do that. So, you know, they're the only things, they're the things I'm working on. It's been a pleasure to talk to you all. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, I'm still a humble chemist, setting fire to things occasionally. Thank you so much for talking to us, Dr. Kern. It's been an absolute pleasure. Signing off.